On The Past This Week, we're featuring a beheaded queen, a music icon, and a brilliant scientist. But we're starting with a dread disease, as if you hadn't had enough of that in 2020. On July 8, 1800, America's Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse used his son as a human guinea pig when he injected him with an experimental smallpox vaccine. With the help of England's Dr. Jenner, who had created a smallpox vaccine using the milder cowpox virus, Dr. Waterhouse developed a similar vaccine for the American side of the pond. On average, 30% of people who got smallpox died, and those who recovered were left with scars on their body and face, which is what happened 238 years earlier to England's Queen Elizabeth I, leading her to use heavy white makeup to cover the scars. But back to 1800, you'll be glad to know Dr. Waterhouse's son was just fine. The vaccine was safe and effective, but for help convincing a skeptical public, Waterhouse contacted President John Adams. When Adams didn't respond, Waterhouse turned to Adams' rival, Thomas Jefferson, who sang the praises of vaccination to the American people. Smallpox was eradicated from the United States by 1949 and worldwide by 1977. On July 9, 1956, America's oldest teenager, Dick Clark, made his first appearance as host on the show that became American Bandstand. Originally a local Philadelphia program, the ABC network picked it up and took it national. In the late 1950s, not only were rock and roll and television new, but the baby boomers, the biggest generation in American history, were becoming teenagers was the perfect combination to lead to American Bandstand and Dick Clark becoming household names. The show featured performances from emerging musical acts like the Beach Boys, the Jackson Five, Madonna, and Prince. There was a Rate of Record segment where teens would offer illuminating reviews like, it's got a good beat. But the heart of the show was the local teens dancing to popular music. The show remained popular and influential until the 1980s when it was eclipsed by the new MTV channel, leading to American Bandstand ending its long run in 1989. From one teenager to another, 400 years apart. On July 10th, 1553, Lady Jane Grey was proclaimed Queen of England. She reigned for nine days. Though Lady Jane was in the line of succession to the throne, she was behind Henry VIII's children, Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth. When Henry VIII died, his nine-year-old son was crowned King Edward VI, and ten-year-old Lady Jane focused on her studies and her Protestant church, traits encouraged by the Duke of Northumberland, who, as the power behind the boy king's throne, was determined to make sure England remained a Protestant country. The problem was the Protestant King Edward was dying, which meant his half-sister, the Catholic Mary Tudor, would become queen next. To keep it from happening, the line of succession was changed so that the crown would pass to Lady Jane. When Edward VI died, 15-year-old Jane was coerced into accepting the crown. However, the public rose in support of Mary Tudor, which was quite a surprise to the Duke. Lady Jane agreed to step down and was imprisoned in the Tower of London, where she pled guilty to high treason, was sentenced to death, and was eventually beheaded. But it's said that the ghost of the tragic Nine Days Queen has been seen at the Tower of London as a white shape on the battlements. From ghostly lights to lights, camera, action. On July 11, 1895, the Lumiere brothers demonstrated their cinematograph to scientists before unveiling their films to the public. Auguste and Louis Lumiere worked for their father's photography business in Lyon, France. When they heard about the American Thomas Edison's kinetoscope, the brothers knew they could do better. While the kinetoscope allowed only one person at a time to view a movie, the Lumiere's three-in-one cinematograph could be used for filming, developing, and projecting movies so that an audience could watch together. The Lumiere's held private screenings to build a buzz of excitement, then held their first public screening in December 1895 at the Grand Café in Paris. It was hugely popular. Their films recorded the reality of everyday French life and by 1905 they had given up movie making to focus on other projects. 
but their invention lent its name to the new form of art and entertainment, cinema. Moving on to July 12, 1954, when President Dwight D. Eisenhower unveiled his grand plan for an interstate highway system. The interstate highway system was a $101 billion plan to create a network of highways that span from coast to coast and border to border. Construction was authorized by the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 and proclaimed complete in 1992 with a length of 48,191 miles. Though there had been earlier efforts to build a national road grid, including the iconic Route 66, a true interstate highway system didn't exist until Eisenhower championed it. He was inspired by his exposure to the German highway system when he served as commander of Allied forces during World War II. The interstate system made cross-country travel quick and relatively safe and decreased shipping costs gains for American travelers and consumers, but with an undeniable environmental impact. Before there was an interstate system, America's rivers acted as a highway for shipping. On July 13, 1832, the source of the Mississippi River was located at Lake Itasca in what is now Minnesota. The credit for locating the headwaters goes to explorer and ethnologist Henry Schoolcraft. While earlier expeditions had identified various locations as the source of the Mississippi, Schoolcraft didn't consider the matter settled, so he took it upon himself to find it, which he did. Schoolcraft wrote many books about his explorations and about the tribes he met. With the help of his wife, Jane Johnston, an educated woman of Ojibwa ancestry, Schoolcraft recorded native languages, folklore, and history, scholarship that became the basis of Longfellow's poem, The Song of Hiawatha. And to end our week, on July 14, 1951, the George Washington Carver National Monument was unveiled in Missouri. A part of the National Park Service, the monument was the first dedicated to a black American and the first for a non-president. The park preserves the boyhood home of a great American scientist. George Washington Carver was born into slavery but persevered to become a noted agricultural scientist and developer of products made from peanuts, sweet potatoes, and soybeans, developments that transformed farming in the South. Tragically separated from his mother during the Civil War, the frail child was raised by his former owners at their farm in Missouri. But George had a thirst for learning. When he was about 11 years old, he left Missouri to acquire an education, eventually earning a master's degree from Iowa State Agricultural College. He then moved to Alabama in the fall of 1896 to direct the new Department of Agriculture at the Tuskegee Institute, where he chose to remain and conduct his important research for the rest of his life. Thanks for listening. Join us next week for more bite-sized history, and please consider subscribing to this channel.